Well, greeting once again. I'm Chuck Anderson, and we've begun a study entitled Learning to Live by the Names of the Lord. Thus far, we've uh, been looking at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, where we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the name for God in, in that passage is the name Elohim. It means the mighty and the powerful God of creation. Elohim occurs some 2,400 times in the Old Testament. It's a wonderful name. Uh, Some people say, well, it's just the generic name for, for God. But that's not true. The name Elohim should mean something very special to to you and to me, to all of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ personally. You see, our help is in the name of the Lord. What is there about the name Elohim that should be an encouragement and a blessing to us? Well, we need to remember that the God who created the universe and all of life, planet Earth, he displays his mighty power in answers to our prayers. I think of that verse in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. And God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. I've even uh, inserted the word anxious. Uh, God is anxious to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. Sometimes we think that God is able, but God really is not much interested in answering my prayers. And uh, we need to correct our thinking on that because God invites us to pray. As we read in Jeremiah 33, in verse 3, he says, Call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Uh, Luke one thirty seven declares for with God, nothing shall be impossible. That's the passage where the angel came and announced to Mary that she would, she would have a, a male child. And she asked the question, how can this be, seeing that I, I had not married and I know not a man? And the angel said, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Well, now today we want to turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 14. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn there. Uh, We will encounter one of the majestic names, and it's the name El Elyon. Perhaps you've never run into that name or have no idea what it means. But it's one of the most glorious and majestic names for our God. And here's what we read in the Word of God. And when Abraham heard that his nephew Lot was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Uh, Dan, by the way, is a, a community that was in the far northern part of Israel. You can visit that place today, the ruins of the ancient city of Dan. He divided his men against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left-hand side of Damascus, which is in Syria. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his nephew Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of El Elyon, the Most High God. El Elyon uh, is the Hebrew word, and it means literally the Most High God. It's a wonderful name. Now, Abraham had just returned from rescuing his son Lot. Lot had been living in Sodom, and uh, some res- some. Enemy soldiers came and, and they, they, they really attacked and, and took the, uh, the goods of, of Sodom going back to Syria. And Lot was one of the captives. 
and his wife and, and so forth. And uh, Abram was just returning from that victorious battle. And uh, when he came back, Abraham was met by an old man, the ageless king of Jerusalem. His name is Melchizedek. You can read about him, I think, in Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, very unusual because it says that he was like the son of God without beginning of days and without end of life. Uh, no mother, no father. I personally think he may have been a, a pre-birth appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't know for sure. But Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High God, El Elyon. And then we read in, the, in that passage of Scripture that Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. El Elyon, God Most High, he's the possessor of heaven and earth. I love the passage of Scripture in Psalm 24 and verse 1 where we read that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they who dwell in it. Uh, literally, that means the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Sometimes we get the idea that, well, I give to the Lord a tenth. That's his part. And the other is all mine. Uh, perhaps we need to adjust some of our thinking, realizing that he's the possessor of heaven and earth. Everything belongs to him. Abraham honored the Most High God by giving Melchizedek a tenth of all the spoils of their battle. He gave a tithe or a tenth of all that they had. And we also can express our faith in the Lord and, and honor him because he is the possessor of all things. And we need to remember that he is the one who gives us the power to get gain. Everything comes from him. Proverbs Chapter 3, verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with the, uh, thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. And then we read in Ephesians chapter 4, Let a man labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to those who are in need. Uh, our reason for working, holding a job, is so that we can be a blessing to others and so that we can honor the Lord. The Apostle Paul expressed his praise of the Lord and the fact that he knew he was merely a servant of the Most High God. Uh, listen to what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and, and verse 1. This is how one should regard us as ministers or servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Sometimes people think of ministers as, as being uh, uh, special people, and they are special because they feed us the word of God and so forth. But literally, the word in Ephesians 4.1 is the word servant. The Apostle Paul considered himself a servant and a steward of the Lord. Servant, by the way, is the Greek word for under oarsman. That is, he considered himself a slave chained to an oar like in a Roman battleship. And you've seen pictures of, uh, of the Roman ships with which they conquered the world, their armies and so forth. Um, the interesting thing about those ships is that they didn't have motorboats, and they didn't have some kind of, uh, they did have sails. But when they went into battle, there were three different decks. Uh, the high deck, of course, where the soldiers were, would be. And then the, a lower deck where there would be oarsmen. They would be literally chained in place. You maybe uh, remember the, the story, um, Ben-Hur. And Ben-Hur was a captive rowing the, the, uh, the oars, pulling on the oars in one of those ships. Uh, but there was not only uh, the lower deck, there were two more decks. And the Apostle Paul said, I'm a slave on the lowest deck. No fresh air down there. These men were destined 
uh, as slaves of Rome to to probably die in that position. And, uh, and that's what Paul said. I have no will of my own. I'm a slave. I'm a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever his will is, that's what I want to do. So he saw himself as a servant, an oarsman, a slave on the lowest level of the ship. I appreciate the fact that the Apostle Paul, there's nothing phony about him. He didn't let his apostleship go to his head. He even said to, to young Timothy, he said that he was the chief of sinners. The Apostle Paul knew that, that he was just a sinner saved by grace. Uh, the Apostle Paul also referred to himself in that passage as a steward of the Lord. What is a steward? Uh, the Greek word for steward means a faithful house. House servant, like a houseboy. But more than that, one who can be trusted. One who is responsible for managing the properties and the household of his master. Remember Joseph, in the book of Genesis, was a trusted servant. And uh, his master never thought about, what do I have in the bank? And where am I making, where am I making investments? Uh, Joseph took care of it all because he was trusted. And that's what the apostle will refer to himself. Not only a servant, but a steward of the Most High God. And then, of course, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, that it's required of stewards that a man be found faithful. And that's what Paul considered himself, just a faithful servant and steward of the Lord. Yes, the Lord uh, possesses everything in the earth, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And we're called to be faithful stewards of all that he possesses. Um, when I was a young married man back in 1968, my wife Joellen and I bought a new car. It was a 68 Plymouth, two-door hardtop. In fact, it was the only new car that we ever bought. But the Lord has provided other vehicles that have been very good. He is the Lord who provides. But that 1968 Plymouth two-door, uh, we pretty soon put about 50,000 miles on it, and I bought another vehicle. Uh, by then, our family was growing, so we needed a station wagon or something, something larger. And, uh, and so I wanted this car to be something that Joellen could go to the store with, etc. And we had a Christian friend who was a missionary in Alaska, and he was down in Colorado. He was going to uh, a school in Greeley, Colorado, to learn how to do instrument flying. And uh, Roger said to us one weekend, I'd like to go home and see my mom and dad. Do you, do you mind if I borrow your car and, and go back to Michigan and see my folks for a couple of days? And I said to Roger, well, you know, it's got 50,000 miles on it, and I've really kind of reserved that car for my wife to go shopping. And I turned him down. That weekend, I was preaching in Meeker, Colorado. And I got a frantic call in the afternoon from Terry Miller, my neighbor. And Terry said, he was all excited, Chuck, we had a windstorm. And the wind blew your patio deck, uh, not deck, but roof, over the roof of your house and it, it went into the car, and it, well, I think it's totaled the car. It's crashed it. I mean, it's, it is smashed. When I got home, I found that that big, heavy roof deck had, had gone right through the, the windshield, knocked the steering wheel down to the seat. Uh, it was a total disaster. And I eventually, I, I scrapped the car for about nothing, and the only thing I got out of it was a little FM radio that I had installed. Later, I, I sold that FM radio for a dollar in a garage sale. But I learned something through that experience, and that is whatever I am entrusted with, I need to use for the glory of the Lord. After all, it's not mine. It's something that the Lord provided. And we need to hold things loosely in our hand. We need to take care of them. We need to be responsible. But if we have an opportunity to use what God has given to us 
uh, use it for his glory, we need to do it. Well, the earth is the Lord's, everything in it. Psalm 24, verse 1. Uh, El Elyon is also the Most High God, not only the possessor of heaven and earth, but he's more than that. In that passage in Genesis 14, we read in verse 20, Blessed be the Most High God, who has delivered thine enemies into thine hand. Now, Abraham wasn't a soldier. He was a shepherd. But he had a large family and a lot of servants. And uh, Abraham's victory over the enemies that had taken his nephew away it was not an accident. It wasn't because he was some kind of a, a special forces trained type of soldier. Not at all. Daniel 2.17 uh, another book in the Old Testament, uh, the, the prophet Daniel said to the king of Babylon that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, El Elyon, rules in the kingdoms of men, El Elyon, the ruler of heaven and earth. The ancient king of Babylon, his name was Nebuchadnezzar, I was very prideful, uh, he had to learn the lesson that the Lord rules. He learned kind of like I did with my car. <laughs> he had to learn the hard way. King Nebuchadnezzar was filled with pride. He looked out at his kingdom. Look at all the things that I have created. And the Lord humbled him. The Lord brought him to a, a place of humility. He gave him, as it were, a wild beast insanity for seven years. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was, was, uh, was totally insane, uh, running around the fields with the wild animals down on all four. His hair grew and became like the, the feathers of an eagle, and uh, his nails would grow long. He was eating grass. Seven years of wild beast insanity until he humbled himself and acknowledged that truly the Lord does rule. By the way, you're going to meet, if you know the Lord is your Savior, you're going to meet Nebuchadnezzar someday. I believe there was genuine repentance and, and fellowship with God. He gave a wonderful testimony of how God had dealt with him. And I think someday we'll meet him. But the Lord rules in the affairs of man, and the Lord reigns. God Most High, El Elyon, he's the possessor of heaven and earth, the possessor of all things, but he also is the ruler. He reigns in the affairs of mankind. You know, we live in a world that seems to be just coming apart at the seams. And as we observe all these, these things going on in our society, we need to remember that El Elyon, God Most High, he rules in the affairs of man. It's an interesting world that we live in. You go to Walmart or wherever you go, you'll see crowds of people all wearing masks. Who would have ever thought such a thing, even six months ago? And uh, hospital beds are now filled. Uh, there's a resurgence going on with the virus. And they're very concerned about uh, ICU units being filled and, and being able to take care of the people that have contacted this terrible disease. I took this picture in uh, Thoreau, New Mexico, several weeks ago. I was stunned when I saw a whole line of brand new fresh graves. Uh, the man, uh, that, one of the men that we talked to at an outreach, he pointed to that picture and he said, you see the, the one grave that has a little fence around it? He said, that's my auntie. And she died of the coronavirus a couple of weeks ago. And that is her grave. Uh, the pastor that we worked with, his wife, Fran, said she knew 45 people who have lost their lives to the virus. Well, we need to remember that El Elyon, the God Most High, rules even when things seem to be falling apart. And then we look at our society where there's open rebellion, a spirit of revolution amongst many. And uh, But in the midst of all of this, uh, where... Where do we place our hope? We place our hope in God Most High, El Elyon, the one who rules. 
We see society breaking into stores, burning buildings, stealing. Uh, let's just keep our minds focused on the fact that El Elyon, God Most High, He rules. Don't let your heart be filled with fear with all the things that are going on. I turn your heart to the Lord today and just, just trust him. Remember that our help is in the name of the Lord. Psalm 124, verse 8. How I love that name, Elohim. Elohim. The mighty God. Powerful God of creation. But also El Elyon. The Lord God Most High, the God who rules, the God who reigns. Let's pause and just give him praise. Lord, I thank you that in the midst of all of our trials, the things that are going on, not only in our country, but around the world, uh, you are the God who reigns. You are our sovereign in your ways, and we can trust you. You know the future. You've not lost control of anything. And someday you're returning. You're going to make all things right. You're going to banish Satan and sin and sickness and heartache and all the things that distress mankind today. There's coming a day of wonderful victory. And we thank you, dear Lord, that you are El Elyon, the Lord God Most High, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We bless you, Lord Jesus. In your blessed name, amen.